I'm going to be talking about orthognathic surgery um, for children with cleft lip and palate. And orthognathic means, well, nathic means jaws, and ortho means straight. So it's um, an operation to uh, place the jaws in a straighter position. Um, typically, this is the facial features of a child born with a cleft lip and palate from age four to 14, four years to 15 years of age. And at, the, um, at age four, the upper jaw is in good position. But over time, you can see that the upper jaw stops growing and the lower jaw continues to grow. So the pro facial profile becomes more con concave with age. And that's um, very typical uh, for patients born with cleft lip and palate. And there's some controversy as to whether or not um, that's part of the uh, uh, cleft um, uh, deformity or whether or not it's a, the result of the surgical correction of the lip and palate. Some of the residual concerns that teenagers have who have cleft lip and palate um, is a small upper jaw, also called maxillary hypoplasia. And the upper jaw can be small in the vertical plane, which means up to down, the sagittal plane, which is front to back, and the transverse plane, which is side to side. The hypoplasia, or the smallness of the upper jaw, extends from the teeth all the way up to the inforbital rims right below the eyes. Um, and is, because of um, the small upper jaw in both the vertical and sagittal dimensions, the lower jaw appears larger than it really is because the lower jaw works on a hinge, and if the upper jaw is too small in the vertical and front to back or sagittal plane, the lower jaw can continue to rotate up and around on that hinge and appear to be uh, too big. The other um, concerns that some young people have uh, are what we call the cleft lip lower lip, um, and that's a lower lip that's a little overgrown. Um, or, or hypertrophied, it's superiorly displaced um, and anteriorly rotated. Um, and uh, there's also um, a variable degree of um, vertical length or elongation uh, and dis posterior displacement, um, which would be um, the chin is a little bit long and set back a little bit, um, in addition uh, to the lower lip, the soft tissue lower lip being um, everted and uh, enlarged. Um, some of the other concerns are nasolabial deformity um, can, um, uh, that may require revision. There can be deviation of the nasal septum, as there is in this patient, into the right nares. Uh, there are small bones in the nose called turbinates, and they can be enlarged, uh, and they can interfere with uh, the patient's ability to breathe out of one nostril or the other. And although the oral nasal fistula, or a hole, the hole that existed between the mouth and nose, uh, was corrected and closed somewhere around the, around the time of the bone at the time of the bone graft, somewhere around the age of nine to eleven years. There can still be a residual fistula or hole from the mo uh, mouth into the nose, and um, often because of the cleft, there's a missing lateral incisor. So once um, the um, the teenager uh, gets close to nearing completion of skeletal growth, it's very important that the team uh, meets together. Um, to provide a plan for each individual patient. And that treatment planning session involves input from the surgeon, whether it be the oral and maxillofacial and or the plastic surgeon, as well as the orthodontist and the prosthodontist. Because um, having this interdisciplinary team working together uh, helps us avoid any mistakes or misunderstandings. We've had, uh, on a rare occasion, a patient who thought that they were ultimately going to have a dental implant to replace the lateral incisor but there was no communication between the orthodontist and the surgeon, and the space that was left for the placement of a lateral incisor was too small. So there wasn't an ability to have a lateral incisor, and the patient was very upset. We don't like those kind of things to happen, and so it's really important that even if your orthodontic care is not being provided here at Children's Hospital, that they, the orthodontist um, where you live and whom you're, who's treating you or your child needs to be intimately involved, uh, our, our team needs to be intimately involved in the planning uh, of care, and that um, needs to be um, conveyed to the treating orthodontist. Some of the things um, that are required to f uh, treat some of these end-stage um, concerns uh, that teenagers have uh, include the Lafort 1 osteotomy, which is a, uh, an operation to move the upper jaw forward. Um, this can be done uh, in one stage while, where we move the upper jaw forward and we hold it in place 
with rigid fixation, which are small plates and screws, or occasionally uh, if the magnitude of the movement, the amount of movement, the upper jaw, the, how, forward, how, how, much, how forward it has to go, um, may be more than we can manage um, with uh, the standard technique, and we may need to use uh, distraction osteogenesis, which I'll explain a little further. At the time of Lafort 1, if there are any residual holes or oronasal fistula between the mouth and the nose, we close those during the same procedure. And as I mentioned earlier, there's often um, a hypoplasia of the upper jaw that extends all the way to the infraorbital rims, and we usually correct that with the use of cheek implants or malar implants. Um, uh, occasionally, if the lower jaw is too big or also too small, we may need to move the lower jaw forward or backward. Uh, with the technique of bilateral sagittal split osteotomies. We usually um, try and correct the lower lip um, deformity that I showed you earlier um, by removing some of, of the skin of the lower lip on the inside, as well as uh, moving the chin with a genioplasty to improve its position as well. If there is a missing lateral incisor and the plan is ultimately for a dental implant, we occasionally place a supplemental bone graft uh, in the region of the missing lateral incisor, and that bone graft is usually taken from around a wisdom tooth site. The septum, the nasal septum, which is occasionally deviated, um, and the turbinate bone, which is overgrown, can be um, removed. The turbinate bone can be reduced, and the septum can be straightened uh, during the same procedure. And then ultimately, at a later date, once the uh, bony skeleton has been um, placed in a better position, Dr. Mulliken would uh, finalize um, the uh, nose and lip uh, with a nasolabial revision. We, can, we usually sit with the patients in advance um, and can show patients options, um, if there exists options, um, for uh, what the surgical correction um, may provide in terms of aesthetics. And it's very important that the patient and their parents uh, play a role in helping us to determine the best operation because there are two components to orthognathic surgery. One is to correct your bite and the other is to improve or provide the best facial aesthetics. And um, that's why it's really important for the patient to play a, a, a significant role uh, if there are choices to be made. So um, this is a young lady here on the left um, who has a cleft lip and palate and you can see the concave facial profile. And we can uh, provide two options uh, for her. One is to correct the underbite entirely by moving the upper jaw forward with a, what's called a Lafort 1 osteotomy. And the other option is to move the upper jaw forward part of the way and move the lower jaw back a little bit uh, to correct the bite. And again, this would be um, presented to the patient. This is a rather um, um, gross depiction of what the change would provide. It can just give you a semblance of what that uh, pre- to post-operative change would be because um, this is actually um, what, the, what um, happened once we, uh, this patient chose to have the upper jaw move forward and the lower jaw move back. And this was the, on the left, the simulation of what that would look like. And this is the real uh, view of what the um, patient looked like a year after the operation. So, you know, you can see that the prediction tracing gives you some idea, rough idea, of what the change may provide, but it's really only a rough idea. She actually looks quite a bit better in real life than she does in this prediction tracing. And just to give you an example of the change that does occur, here she is before the operation, and here she is uh, a year after having her upper jaw moved forward, her lower jaw moved back. We put cheek implants in and uh, um, uh, corrected the lower lip deformity. Now, every patient provides a different, has a different amount of hypoplasia, and on a rare occasion, we see a young man such as this who actually looks quite good. He has minimal, um, uh, I would say mild uh, maxillary hypoplasia, um, and the, his bite was, um, had, he had a very minimal underbite, which might have been correctable with just orthodontic treatment alone. But um, he was a little bit troubled by the uh, flatness of the upper part of his face, and so he made the decision, rather than to correct the underbite with just trying to camouflage it by moving teeth around to actually uh, put the teeth in the proper position and then move the upper jaw forward. And so here he is a year after having the upper jaw. The upper jaw was moved forward and down a little bit so you could see a little bit more of his front teeth. 
And um, this is his occlusion or his bite after that operation. Uh, there's been adequate space left for a lateral incisor tooth and he'll be having an implant placed or he ha ultimately had an implant placed. Um, and here's the picture of the radiograph um, after the operation, the, moving the upper jaw forward, and you can see the small plates and screws, which we also call the rigid uh, fixation that we used to uh, secure the upper jaw into its proper position. So here he is before and after, and you can see, at least in this frontal view, that he didn't show any of his upper teeth before the operation because the upper jaw was vertically short. So the upper jaw was not only moved forward in the front to back, uh, dimension, but it was also long, elongated in the front, so he showed a little bit of his front teeth. And there's the change in the lateral view. Again, a very minor change, um, but he was pleased uh, with this, and so are we. Now, you saw this picture previously. This is a young woman who had a more moderate amount of uh, hypoplasia of her upper jaw that extended all the way up to the inforbital rims. And she was a little out of the realm of um, orthodontic treatment alone. Um, and so she had a combination of braces that were put on her teeth for some period of 18 to 24 months, and every patient's a little bit different, but that's about standard. 18 to 24 months of braces uh, with the jaw operation to follow, with the braces still on, and then some period of orthodontic treatment once the operation uh, has been completed, usually in the realm of another 6 to 12 months. So we're usually talking in these cases somewhere between 24 and 36 months or two and three years in braces with an operation sort of somewhere half to two-thirds of the way in between that orthodontic treatment. Um, her underbite was, as you um, can see, was a little more extensive than the last uh, patient's, and she had her upper jaw forward and uh, cheek implants placed, um, and this is her occlusion or her bite after the operation. In her particular case, she was missing a lateral incisor, and so one of the things that we can talk, we'll talk about a little later in the talk is that replacing that lateral incisor, there are a variety of options. In this particular case, for um, some um, particular reasons which had, which had to do with spacing um, in the upper jaw, uh, the canine tooth was placed in the lateral incisor position. So this is actually her eye tooth, not her lateral incisor, um, but she did not then require a dental implant or, or any other replacement tooth. And that's the uh, x-ray after the upper jaw has been brought forward. And here she is before and after. And the real change um, for most patients is in the profile view. There's a fairly um, significant change that occurs. There's a little more support for the upper lip. There's more fullness in the cheek area because of the malar implants. And in addition, you actually get a small change in the nose that occurs as the upper jaw is moved forward, the tip of the nose elevates, uh, and the, uh, the, the um, nose becomes a little bit straighter rather than having a hump. Now this young boy had a little bit more maxillary hypoplasia. So we had mild, moderate, and I would call this a little more, more moderate to severe. Uh, and he has a fairly extensive underbite. You can see the lower lip uh, is fairly rolled out. Um, he has even a bigger underbite. Uh, he also has, um, the, there's no overlap of the uh, upper and lower teeth. Um, he is, so he has what we call an open bite. And here he is about six months after having his upper jaw moved forward cheek implants placed, and the lower lip rolled in a little bit. And um, again, the uh, hardware, the plates and screws, and here's his bite afterwards. And here he is before and after again. You can see that in the frontal view, there's been a change in that you can see more of his teeth uh, now because we've uh, improved the vertical position of the upper jaw. But the real change, once again, is in the sagittal um, or the uh, profile view. This is a, a patient with more severe um, a hypoplasia of the upper jaw, uh, fairly significant, and um, you can see that the magnitude and the discrepancy of the upper and lower jaw is within about a, uh, a half to three quarters of an inch, um, and this is not amenable to just orthodontic treatment. So um, even standard jaw surgery where we move it forward and use plates and screws to hold it in place is difficult in, these, in, in this particular case. So uh, for this patient, we use the technique of distraction osteogenesis. And distraction osteogenesis is a way of stretching the bone. So uh, the a cut is made in the bone, and then the, the um, distraction appliance is placed. And then over a series of a few weeks, um, the, these, uh, um, devi the device is turned at home uh, usually by the parent, which um, puts tension on the upper jaw and slowly brings it forward. Uh, once it's brought into the proper position, it needs to be held in that position for several weeks to allow it to heal. Um, 
And here he is uh, after the procedure, um, about a year postoperatively, and the, uh, his bite afterwards, he actually went on to have uh, crowns placed on the front teeth. Uh, and there is the postoperative view. And you can see because of um, this technique of having bone uh, fill in as the upper jaw is brought forward, we don't need to use plates and screws to hold it in its new position because there's bone formed in the uh, gaps uh, and healed that way. And here he is before and after. And again, the major change occurs in the lateral view uh, pre to postoperatively. Um, occasionally, we have a patient with a cleft that um, has, has a problem also with, this, with the lower jaw. And in this particular patient, uh, not only was his upper jaw too small, the lower jaw was a little, fo a little large and asymmetric. So the chin is actually deviated over to the left side. And that won't be changed by just moving the upper jaw forward. So in this particular patient, we moved the upper jaw forward and the lower jaw back slightly and it rotated to the patient's right side. And so this is the preoperative occlusion. You can see there's it's, uh, very, very few teeth meet. Uh, the x-ray showing the discrepancy in the, um, the upper and lower teeth. And here he is a year after having his upper jaw moved forward and his lower jaw rotated to the right to improve the asymmetry in the lower jaw. And again, um, before and after. And the real change occurs in the lateral view. And this is the, um, his bite. I haven't seen him recently, uh, but he'll be um, going on to get his braces off and ultimately having a dental implant placed. And this is not him because I didn't have his postoperative uh, films um, available, but this is another patient who had both the upper and lower jaw. And you can see just the hardware um, for the, um, fixing the bones in their new position in both the upper and lower jaw. And finally, um, once we have um, the upper and lower jaw positioned properly, uh, if there's a missing tooth, we need to think about how that's going to be replaced. Actually, we would have been thinking about that in, in the full orthodontic plan, but we'll replace that tooth at this stage. Uh, in addition, if there's any further deviation of the septum or crookedness of the nose or widening of the nose, that can be repaired, uh, and any revision to the lip will also occur, again, after the jaw surgery, and that would be something that Dr. Mulliken would talk with you about. Um, some of the options that Dr. Um, Vasudevan already spoke about in terms of replacing the lateral incisor include putting the, the canine in the lateral incisor position. And again, that has, uh, um, has to do with um, so, uh, the amount of space that exists in the arch for all the teeth and also whether or not the eye tooth or canine tooth has the appropriate, appropriate aesthetics to look more like a lateral incisor. Um, if we're going to replace the lateral incisor, that can either be done with a bridge or a dental implant. Um, and our decision about whether to, make, to, to replace the tooth with a bridge or an implant depends on whether there's enough space, whether there's enough bone, uh, whether or not the uh, maxillary central incisor um, is going to need uh, a, a crown to make it look better. Um, and if we are considering a, a dental implant, we may need to augment the area for the dental implant with a bone graft. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, we usually take that from around the wisdom tooth, not from the hip again. And we like to coordinate the placement uh, of, the, uh, of the lateral incisor tooth, whether it be with the bridge or a dental implant, uh, prior to um, removal of the orthodontic appliances. And so just to show you the options, uh, you can bring the canine into the lateral position, as we showed earlier, that's mesializing the canine. We can replace the lateral incisor with a dental implant, as was done here. Um, occasionally, a Maryland bridge, which is a false tooth, uh, with a little bit of a pink acrylic that's um, attached to the back, just the back of the two teeth on either side can be used. Uh, and finally, we can have full crowns on all the teeth replacing one that lateral incisor. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Vasudevan showed you, this is what a typical dental implant looks like, and this is what up close the dental implant uh, looks like clinically. And if, if possible, is really the best restoration. Um, and then just to uh, touch on, um, once the upper jaw has been uh, positioned properly, uh, any uh, nasal um, uh, problems or deformity can be managed um, as this uh, young lady had with a bone graft to her nose uh, after her upper jaw uh, was brought forward and here she is in the lateral view. So this was just an overview of um, orthognathic surgery for patients with cleft lip and palate and um, thank you for your attention.